dear uh, facebook uh, pure urology viewers good evening one and all as you all know uh, we are doing on a regular basis surgical technique based uh, video presentations in this forum today we have an esteemed uh, uh, speaker well known uh, andrologist of india not only india but across the world dr rupin shah sir who is senior andrologist from mumbai he will be talking about uh, penile implant surgery which is again a big subject it is unfair to ask to present in uh, 20 to 40 minutes like this but as uh, some of the juniors might have not exposed in their career uh, these surgeries at least if they are interested in the early part of the career they can choose and, and enter uh, like the like the way seniors have done so keeping that in view today we are doing this andrology topic wherein sir will present on the panel implant surgeries before we end over the program uh, good evening sir rupin shah sir good evening good evening uh, thank you for inviting me sir, pleasure thank you, thank you for sparing your valuable time sir uh, i uh, did mch from pj chandigarh in 2006 since then i am in hyderabad listening about uh, uh, you and uh, in hyderabad when we conduct the national conference also you have been guest speaker where halls are always full you are a very crisp speaker we all know that and you the people say that uh, you maintain uh, good timings and discipline about your uh, your practice so inst anyway you will be talking about the surgical technique i like to know so that we all get motivated this is also important every talk i am taking 10 minutes of time let me know sir first uh, where is your surgical training sir ms general surgery so my entire training was in Mumbai at the KEM Hospital, St. GS Medical College, MBBS, MS, MCH, all from there. This is KEM, KEM, no, sir, KEM. King, King Edward Memorial. Edward, sir. Uh, the KEM Hospital is well known at that time. Who was your mentor in surgery, sir? So my general surgery mentor was Dr. A.B. Samsi. Sir. Very senior, very well known person who was a very good surgeon, but also did homeopathy. So his OPD in the general surgery would be from 8 o'clock till 1 o'clock general surgery. And sir. then for one hour, he would dispense homeopathic medicines. Sir. And my urology was with Dr. Professor D.S. Pardhanani, okay. who was one of the first urologists to have a interest in andrology, especially erectile dysfunction. So sir. in fact, that's how my interest started, because I was lucky when I joined the urology department in KM. That was in those days the only urology department in the country that had an operating microscope in the department. So that's how I got initially interested in microsurgery. Sir. And, yes, sir. And he was also very interested in erectile dysfunction. So that's how the whole thing started. Is he practicing or where, where is he? I mean, no, he... he again, wonderful balance. After he retired as professor, he stopped urology, he went to USA. He wrote several books related to the history of Sindh because he's from Sindh. He's had an interest in Sindh music history and pursued a completely different path, showing that we need to be multifaceted and not just narrowed down to our profession. Profession, yeah. So surprisingly, KM uh, being, uh, I think it is a government uh, hospital only in Mumbai. I, I remember the short period I stayed. Uh, the Cyan Hospital, KEM, uh, JJ Hospital, among which uh, KEM has that institutional uh, institutional uh, uh, feeling like uh, AIMS Chandigarh, like that. In in what what uh, what is the secret of KEM being made? Even today, neonatology KEM is considered as the best. Cardiac surgery KEM is considered as the best. Uh, who do you remember anybody who has developed the institute like that? I think. See, KM is municipal, not government. JJ is government, but KM, Nair, Cyan were municipal and are municipal hospitals. I think KM founded its tradition based on the legendary honoraries who used to work there. Now the system has changed to full-timers. But when I was a student till then and till a few years later, there was a system of honoraries. So the senior most people, the legends almost, would spend their time from 9 a.m. to 12 noon in the hospital, teaching, taking rounds, demonstrating surgeries. And rest of the time, they would be there in their practice. And because of them, I think 
that tradition developed. And then, of course, some very good full timers also added to it. Yeah. But that was the tradition. Some of the biggest giants and names were from there. You, you, your parents are also from Mumbai, sir? Uh, my father was born in Burma. Sir. And my mother was born in Nagpur. Okay. But, yeah, basically they would consider themselves as Mumbaiites. And I, I mean, you were a day scholar uh, when you were going to MBBS? Yeah. You used to go by from your house? Yeah, but always in the final terms, we used to go and stay in the hostel. So for okay. so the final terms, it's always hostel because that's when you can study 16 hours, go into somebody's room, share with them, learn, teach. So you had to stay in the hostel for the final term. You, 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 after MCH, uh, uh, did you directly concentrate on andrology or you practiced general urology for some time? So after MCH, I went to Belgium to train in andrological microsurgery. Okay. And I was the first urologist from India in those days. This is 1986. You had the facility, financial affordability to go there. To go time. there. So that opportunity allowed me to go there. So I took it. And then when I came back, again, I joined the KM hospital as a lecturer for a year to develop this microsurgery. Yes, sir. And after that, I left the KM. And for the first couple of years, I did urology and andrology. Sir. But by 1990, I had enough work in andrology. So I dropped urology completely. And since then, I'm doing only andrology. So from 1990? Onwards, only andrology. 1990, only andrology. So, uh, in your andrology practice, we came to know that you maintain your timings. Uh, you won't uh, uh, run from morning to night. This is what I heard 15 years back. I am extremely sorry to go into the personal detail. Why? Because there is no limit for the earning money. There is no limit for the getting fame. But uh, you also have written papers and... Uh, what was in your mind in the beginning and now how do you compare with might have been a definitely a good student being KM, Bombay, uh, uh, MBBS, MS, MCH is not a joke. So wh what uh, what was your transformation in life that how you maintained your career then? Uh, so there were two things. One is of course the career part and when I decided to do only andrology, I spoke to many people because remember 1986, 1990, those days super specialization not there. was not there and andrology was unheard of amongst unheard. urologists. Unheard. So every senior I spoke to said, Rupin, you are making a mistake. You cannot localize yourself to just one area like andrology. And I thought about it a lot. And I said that, okay, if I do decide to do only andrology, that decision will be justified if I can achieve three things. One, the care that I provide in India should be world-class. Nobody should be able to say that, okay, we don't have this here, but if you go abroad, you will have it. So okay. that was the first goal. The second goal was to indigenize, to make sure that we have solutions that are characteristic of the Indian requirements. And yes. that's how the Indian prosthesis was developed and many other things. I would feel that a lot of the andrology we do stands out and apart from the global practice because it's more relevant to us, whether it is the biomix we use for intrapenal injections, the implant, or many other things. And the third was the decision that, okay, if I do only andrology, I should have an active teaching program that would then transmit what I've learned through all this effort to the general urologist. And for 20 years, we've had an annual andrology training program, first in Bombay, and for the last 10, 12 years in Nadiad which has been attended by several thousand urologists over the year. Yeah, I also attended, sir. Yes, sir. So those were the three motivating factors. At the same time, there was always the understanding that one is not just one's work. You need to have that balance between professional work and personal life. So KM, in that sense, I was lucky. We had a very active debating department, very active cultural department, a trekking department, and the Sayadris are very close to Bombay. So many weekends, we would have treks with the college group going off into the mountains. And all those interests continued. And that's how, in addition to working, I could always maintain some time for myself to follow these passions. Yes, sir. So before going to the topic, I will, I will introduce uh, uh, the uh, officially your uh, curriculum uh, vitae and then we hand over the program sir thank you for sharing the personal details again to mention 
what we remember dr upinsha is a cool uh, professor who is not agitated always calm focusing on his talk very crisp speaker he is definitely those who are listening first time will have uh, a lot of uh, a clear idea how a topic is spoken and uh, and uh, much more is that his discipline in personal life uh, some said that he practices yoga a diet and discipline in his life also which is beyond the scope of today but we wish we follow some of the very good things from sir consultant andrologist and microsurgeon from leelavathi hospital and research center mumbai again to his credential to my memory last 16 years he is in the same hospital in my phone it is noted like rupinsha leelavathi like that it is it is mentioned uh, that again shows uh, he, he he stick on to some basic principles he has, he is microsurgical for uh, male spe, uh, for infertility sperm retrieval in jazuspermia penile prosthesis implantation as you all know on his name only penel process is highly successful not only in india i don't know in the world they may be using this because it is very cost effective at least i am using it only thing is that it is difficult to get only one vendor will supply and uh, uh, the scale you have to you will take it back these are the things i like to ask at the end of the talk he is founder president south south asian society for sexual medicine published over 100 papers and 26 book chapters associate editor fertility and reproduction multiple awards including urology president gold medal and dr bc rai award i did not know this it's great moment sir i am very happy that i am interviewing very uh, well known uh, professor today thank you very much over to you sir for the program uh, thank you very much dr chandramohan for the invitation and for this very warm introduction that was a very nice idea to have a personal touch in the beginning it makes the speaker come alive for the audience yes sir and uh, i was when you invited me i was wondering how we should frame this talk because i understand it will be a very mixed audience there'll be some young urologists some senior urologists many people who do have no exposure to erectile dysfunction some who are doing implants some who are very senior so i thought i'd divide the talk into different aspects i'm going to start by sharing my screen now yes sir and uh, the first part of the talk will um focus on i think this was the wrong talk that opened i have two talks no problem, yeah in so sequence um you can roll it back to first slide somehow only this talk is opening let me shut the talk sir it is it is 2 3 powerpoint presentations yeah movies, yeah the two powerpoint presentations okay. then uh, you have to yeah here we are okay no. sir you can share by uh, clicking the yeah uh, now uh, can you see the screen no no sir not yet not yet you have not shared the screen i think okay Share Let's the screen and uh, uh, media. You have to click uh, optimize. optimize the video. Now are you seeing it? Ah, uh, penile process is implantation. Yeah, correct. That is the first slide. Yes, sir. So this is going to be the first part of my talk. Where, given the fact that most people may be novices. Yes. we're going to introduce the implants so who gets an implant who should not get an implant very important what are the types of implants how do we work up a person for the implant so these are basics so even a general urologist who may not be doing an implant would still want to know this so that they can advise their patients correctly yes and then in the latter part we'll go into the technical details for those who are doing implants and may want to know a few things the time is not a concern please take your time sir. sure so who do we implant uh, somebody with vasculogenic ed that means severe erectile dysfunction who is non responsive to a pd5 inhibitor like sildenafil and who is non responsive to intracavernosal injections and this could be because of arterial insufficiency or venous leak it may be primary from birth or it could be acquired and i'm going to talk a little bit more about this because i find that this area is not understood and a lot of young men are wrongly diagnosed resulting in 
false penile implantation. And we need to be aware of that. Then, of course, there's a group of men with cavernosal fibrosis, either as a result of a priapism due to a variety of reasons, or because they've had a prior implant, there was infection, the implant is taken out, and then they need a second implant to regain erection. Some men have a neophallus, either because they lost their phallus or because it's a gender reassignment surgery. And they also need an implant finally in the neophallus to give stiffness. And finally, recently, Dr. Sanjay Pandey, my good friend from Kokila Ben, told me, Rupin, I have a new indication. And he's had a few men, really obese, diabetic, hypertensive, and big bellies, and their penis has shrunk completely. So when they want to pass urine, they can't find the penis, and they wind up soiling their clothes. And in such men, he's put in an implant just to make the penis cosmetically more accessible. So that could be an interesting indication. But the first thing I want to talk to you about is how to diagnose and work up a patient. Now, here is a radical statement, because those of you who do look at erectile dysfunction probably use the penile color Doppler as a main diagnostic tool. And I'm going to tell you today that it's a useless tool. So that's quite a radical statement. But the reason I need to make this statement is because every week I see cases like this. Young man, unconsummated marriage, went to the urologist. The urologist gave him a prescription for Tadalafil or Sildenafil. Patient came back saying, Doc, I didn't succeed. My erection was not strong enough. And so he's referred for a penile color Doppler. The report comes back, venous leak. And the surgeon now tells him, OK, you need a penile implant. And then these patients, some of them come to me for a second opinion. And usually, I find that this is not yet a candidate for a penile implant because this patient has not yet been adequately worked up. A penile color Doppler can be highly misleading. And I need to explain this because a lot of you who will be going in for a penile prosthesis will wonder how to work up the patient. The problem with a penile color duplex Doppler is that it is often wrongly advised, frequently incorrectly performed by a sonologist who doesn't know what he's doing. It's advised because the urologist doesn't know what to do next. And it's done by a sonologist who's very scared, who's either giving an inadequate stimulation to the penis or doesn't know what to look for. So as a result, there are many false positive and false negatives. And it should not actually be used to diagnose vasculogenic ED, but merely to confirm the type of ED. So let me explain why penile color Doppler doesn't work when you're trying to work up a patient for a penile prosthesis. There are two erectogenic systems in the male. One is a cyclic GMP pathway through nitric oxide, which causes vasodilatation. The second is the cyclic AMP pathway through acetylcholine and VIP, which also causes vasodilatation. And there is a sympathetic pathway which causes vasoconstriction. If a man is very anxious, stressed, the sympathetic tone will overcome the parasympathetic tone. And this man will not relax the corporal muscle and not get an erection, even though he may have no physical problem. So what happens during a penile color Doppler is usually it is done with papaverine alone. And papaverine only activates the cyclic AMP, cyclic GMP pathway, but does not block the sympathetic pathway. And very often, these young men are extremely stressed. They are in the environment of the sonologist chamber. Three people are hovering around. They've been given papaverine, which is very painful. They're not aroused. And a lot of them will tell you, Doc, I didn't get any erection at all. Whereas normally I get a much better erection than what I got during the study. So why does that result in a false diagnosis? You have to recognize, as you can see to the left, that in the resting state, the cavernosal smooth muscle is contracted and the venous channels are open. Only when the cavernosal smooth muscle is relaxed, as you see to the right, will the venous channels be occluded and venous leak stop. Now, all of you listening to this talk, if I were to do a penile color Doppler on you just now, all of you will show venous leak because that is the normal physiological state of the penis. If I ask you to now stimulate and arouse yourself, obviously listening to my talk, you're not going to get very aroused. There may be a partial erection, 
and the study will still show venous leak because the cavernosal spaces are not fully dilated and it may show arterial insufficiency. Only if you switch off this talk, go to the room, fantasize, stimulate, will your cavernosal smooth muscle open and a true picture emerge. For a lot of young men undergoing a penile color Doppler, they are in the same state. They're not adequately stimulated. The cavernosal smooth muscle is not adequately relaxed. And then they wind up with a study like this. So here is a young man, unconsummated marriage. Penile color Doppler is reported as arterial insufficiency. He was advised a penile implant, came to me. We did an intrapenile injection of just 0.2 ml of bimix. And he had this full erection sustained for half an hour. Obviously, there was no insufficiency at all. It was just an inadequately done test. This was a very interesting study on young men who underwent a duplex scan. They were diagnosed as venous leak. They were then counseled. They underwent psychotherapy. They got re reassured. And when the repeat test was done, majority of them turned out to be normal. So before you advise an implant in a young man especially, do two tests. One is the office sildenafil test. And the other is the intracavernosal injection of vasoactive drugs. Now, these are outside the scope of this talk, but very briefly, office sildenafil test means you give him 100 milligrams of sildenafil, one hour later, ask him to stimulate himself in the privacy of a room. And if he gets a good full sustained erection, there is no vascular problem. If he fails to respond to sildenafil, you do an intracavernosal injection, not with peparin, but with bimix either peparin fentolamine or peparin chlorpromazine, or use PG. Even in a lot of young men and some older men whom you think needed a penile implant will turn out to be normal. So just this brief message, because I'm seeing too many young men coming to me for a second, third opinion, who have been advised a penile implant, and when we evaluate them, we find that they do not need the implant. Relative contraindication, somebody who is responding to the injection. He will come to you and say, Doc, I'm taking the injection, but I would like an implant. Well, if they're very scared and they absolutely don't want the injection, you could do an implant. But if somebody has been using the injection for some time successfully and getting a good erection, he will probably be disappointed with the implant because the natural erection that somebody gets with the injection is superior to that which they get with the implant. Rarely you will get men with no abnormality, but severe psychogenic erectile dysfunction, not responding to the tablet or the injection, their marriage is breaking down. Sometimes such men may receive an implant, but they need a lot of counseling, a proper psychiatric workup. And if there's a major psychological disturbance, we will not implant them. But if they're highly, highly anxious with a psychologist and a psychiatrist, sometimes we do implant such men. Now, this is a condition that many urologists will encounter, fracture pelvis, rupture urethra, one urethroplasty failed, then a second major surgery with a, uh, with a suprapubic dissection, nibbling of the bone, a pull through urethroplasty. Finally, you achieve patency of the urethra, but the penis falls back and is really short. And the stretch length of this penis is only four or five centimeters. Here, severe erectile dysfunction comes to you, there's no point putting an implant in this man because even with the implant, he will be sexually non-functional. So two messages here. One, of course, that do not implant a very, very short penis. It will not help. And second, when you consider urethral reconstruction, don't be over-aggressive because these are young men. If you're going to shorten the penis too much at the cost of urethral continuity, you will then deprive him of a sex life for the rest of his life. So keep that in mind while planning the urethral reconstruction. Absolute contraindications, you don't want to implant someone with poor diabetes. Spinal cord injury have a very high complication rate. Someone with a neurogenic bladder or unresolved outflow obstruction, you will have problems after with the implant. And of course, if someone has severe psychosis, you don't want to implant them. Now, what are the types of implants? Basically, two types. Non-inflatable, where the penis will remain constantly erect, the length remains constant, the girth remains constant, the rigidity is constant. However, the penis can be bent because the implant is either malleable with a wire inside or the implant has a hinge 
as you can see to the right. So this allows concealment. It sounds weird, but actually these patients get very used to the implant and the success rates are very good. So fundamentally, the non-inflatable implants are of two types. To the left, you see the original malleable implant, which was the AMS 650. Very good implant, no longer available. It has been replaced by the Tactra, which I will show you in the moment. And to the right is the Shah implant, where there is no silver wire or steel wire inside. Instead, it is made of silicon of different rigidity. So the front part of the implant is stiff silicon. The central part is soft silicon. So at the center, the penis can bend down and the patient has good concealment. And when he removes his underwear, the implant springs up, he supports the base and he can have penetration. This is the Tactra, which is the newer malleable from Boston Scientific. It consists of a very smooth silicon surface and the inner core, which was earlier steel, is now a metal called nitinol core, which gives very good stiffness. It comes in three diameters. The problem with the Tactra is that it's very new, but those who have used the wide diameter, the 13 millimeter, find that it is very, very stiff and concealment is difficult. So if the patient has a narrow penis, you're using a 9 or 11 millimeters, it seems to be good with good stiffness, good concealment. But if it's a wide corpus and you use a wider diameter implant, there can be a problem with concealment. The second type of implant is the inflatable implant. So to the right, you see the classic three-piece inflatable. The cylinders are soft. So when they're in the, in the penis, the penis is actually soft and flaccid. The two cylinders are connected to a pump, which is in the scrotum, which in turn is connected to the reservoir, which is at the suprapubic space. The three piece is also condensed into the two piece implant where the reservoir is missing because it's placed in the base of the cylinder. The two piece is a very good implant for selected cases. Unfortunately, the company has stopped making it. So we still have a residual stock, but soon the two piece will not be available and we will have the three-piece alone. So this is the latest version of the three-piece from the AMS American Medical Systems now bought over by Boston Scientific. You can see the pump at the bottom, which is a corrugated pump, which can be pressed. Above that is a one-touch release valve. So when the patient presses the valve, the deflation happens. You can see the cylinder and the reservoir is coated with a brownish substance called inhibizone, that's a mixture of uh, rifampicin and gentamicin, which inhibits bacterial growth and reduces the chance of infection. So highly effective implant. Unfortunately, the model sold in India doesn't have inhibizone. It is the non-coated model. So as I told you, the cylinders are in the penis, the reservoir in the retropubic space, the pump in the scrotum, in the flaccid state, the penis looks normal when the patient wants an erection. Through the scrotum, he feels the pump squeezes it several times, which will transfer fluid from the reservoir to the pump and from the pump into the cylinder. And the cylinder will expand in girth from 12 to 18 millimeters. There is a, the LGX model, which also elongates in length to fill up the penis properly and make it erect. And when intercourse is over, he will press the button which you see above the pump, that rounded button, and that will cause the fluid to flow back from the reservoir through the pump, from the cylinder through the pump back into the reservoir, achieving deflation. The other company that makes the inflatable is Coloplast. The material of the AMS Boston scientific implant was silicon. The Coloplast implant is made of PTFE, polytetrafluoroethylene which is a very strong material. So it's a single layer cylinder. It can expand to any extent. So it's very good in large penises. You can see the reservoir is a little bulkier. Coloplast is a good implant, cheaper than the Boston Scientific. Unfortunately, they do not as yet have a license for India. So the models available in India are smuggled in and that's not very good in terms of getting the full range of implant or having the warranty. Therefore, currently the only officially available one is the Boston Scientific. There are some newer companies like Zephyr, which have the advantage of being less expensive. The disadvantage is that they're relatively new and as yet not officially available in India. 
So how do they compare? The non-inflatable, much cheaper. So the Shah implant, the Indian non-inflatable is only 23,000. The Tactra is about 1,25,000. So the Indian one is much, much cheaper. It's mechanically stable. So if a patient is worried about the implant failure, then the non-inflatable is better. It's an easy surgery. So most novice implanters will start with the non-inflatable. And it's very easy for the patient to use this implant because you just bend it up and down. There's no learning curve. So from that point of view, the non-inflatable for these conditions is better. The inflatable, a lot more expensive. The Boston Scientific sold in India, the cost is roughly 7.2 to 7.8 lakhs, depending on the model. Uh, then there may be some discount or some hospitals will charge a surcharge. So it becomes very expensive. It does have a mechanical failure rate. So at 10 years, the average survival is 80%. We have had some patients who have needed replacement before five years. There is a warranty for five years. After that, the patient has to pay for the implant again. It's a more complex surgery. So the novice implanter may get confused. It's also more difficult to use the inflatable. There is a learning curve involved. But the inflatable gives a far more natural erection because it will expand to fill the corpus nicely. And when it is detumest, it is more flaccid, so it looks more natural. So in terms of cosmesis and function, the inflatable is better, though there is a learning curve. So an older patient who has difficulty with his fingers and cannot manipulate may not be very happy with the inflatable. The non-inflatable, sometimes the patient has to modify his underwear to achieve concealment, and it is a little more artificial in its feeling. Are implants safe in diabetics? So this was a study where they compared a large number, 900 diabetic men with all kinds of HbA1c's, and they found that if the HbA1c was less than 7.5, the risk of infection was low, but as the HbA1c went up, the infection rate went up. So you can certainly implant a diabetic, but the message to the young urologist is that don't be in a hurry. Often a patient comes to you and you're very tempted. You don't want to lose the patient. So you tell them, no, my diabetologist will control your sugar. We'll bring it down. We'll operate. And I know many centers that do operate and claim that they have good results. But if you look at the evidence, it's certainly worth waiting. If he's a smoker, get him to stop smoking. That increases the risk of infection tremendously. If his HbA1c is not good, get him to change his lifestyle because it's not just the implant, but later on also that he will have a greater risk of infection. So you can operate, but be patient, control them, because the implant is really one of the best solutions for treating erectile dysfunction. However, it needs to be chosen correctly and done correctly. Now, I think we have uh, how much time more do I have accordingly? I'll decide which yes, talk. To we do. spent around 25 minutes of time. Right. We can take another 20, 25 minutes. Okay. Of time. So I will use the next time to explain a different section of the talk, which is uh, how to use the shy implant more effectively. Because the shy implant is what most people will start with. And you need to understand the shy implant because the tricky thing about the shy implant is that you need to choose the right model so that you will then get the best positioning of the hinge. Yes, so sir. are we seeing the shy implant? Yes. yes sir. So uh, sharp and processes. Correct. So the shy implant, as I said, is a differential rigidity implant. The tip is soft. Then there's a stiff region which fills most of the penis. But then very important is a soft central zone, which is what allows concealment. And there's a final stiff zone behind which can be trimmed to adjust the total length. There are also two sleeves. And understanding these two sleeves is important because they give you a lot of flexibility in achieving the perfect fit in the patient. And if you don't understand how to remove the sleeves, you will just remove them in every patient and lose the advantage that the implant offers. And the rare tip extenders used to be half one, one and a half. In the newer packaging, which you will probably get, you'll see one, two and three centimeter rare tip extenders. The advantage is it's much, much cheaper than any implant in the world. It can be used in patients who don't have much dexterity. Manually, it is very reliable. 
And if you have a difficult implant, it's a very flexible implant to use. So even if I'm planning an inflatable, I will keep the Shah implant available just in case I run into difficulty. Now, there are some measurements that need to be considered. And the most important is positioning the hinge by selecting the right model. Now, what do we mean by that? The hinge is the central part of the implant. It's five centimeters long. And it needs to be positioned at the base of the penis so that there is good concealment. So ideally, the hinge should be positioned half in front of the symphysis, half behind the symphysis, so that the penis can be bent down. If too much of the hinge protrudes in front of the symphysis, it will become floppy. And if no hinge protrudes in front of the symphysis, there will not be any stiff, there will be too much stiffness. So we have four models. WH stands for width hinge. You have WH9, 11, 13, and 15. WH9 is meant for a stretched penile length from symphysis to mid glands of 9 centimeters or 10 centimeters. Now, how does that work? Model WH9, as you will see in the diagram, has 7 centimeters of stiff zone in the front. And after that lies the hinge. So if you put WH9 in a penis which are 9 or 10 centimeters long, you'll have 7 centimeters of stiffness and then 2 to 3 centimeters of hinge, which is ideal for good concealment. If you choose WH11, you should use it for a stretched penile length of 11 or 12 centimeters. WH11 has 9 centimeters of stiffness. So in an 11 centimeter penis, you will get nine centimeters of stiffness and then two centimeters of hinge. In a 12 centimeter stretched penile length, you will get nine centimeters of stiffness and three centimeters of hinge, again giving a good result. WH13 has 11 centimeters of stiff zone, so it is good for a stretched penile length of 13, 14, maybe 15 centimeters. And WH15 has 13 centimeters of stiff zone, so long penis. 16 centimeters, you need good concealment and good stiffness, then you use WH15. Now, the WH refers to the hinge, not to the diameter. As we saw, WH15 and WH13 both have a diameter of 15 millimeters, which can be reduced to 13 or 11 by removing one sleeve or two sleeves. And WH13 and WH11 have a diameter of 13 millimeters. So just bear that in mind. So the second thing that you need to consider is once you have selected the implant model based on the stretched penile length, then you will use the intraoperative measurement to determine what diameter of implant and what total length of the implant. And the diameter is important. If you just remove both the sleeves for every patient, the implant will become too narrow. And if it is too narrow, it will wobble within the penis and not give good stiffness. If you just put in the implant without adjusting the diameter, it may be too wide for that corpus and it will be very, very tight and the patient will have a lot of pain post-op. So what you have to do is put in two dilators at the same time. See which is the largest dilator. Are two WH11s fitting? Are two WH9s fitting? Are two, are two 13 millimeter diameter fitting or two 11 millimeter or two nine millimeter. And accordingly, you will select the diameter. And then you may decide, okay, I've selected model WH11 because the stretched penile length was 11 centimeters. And I'm able to put in one dilator of 11 millimeters and a second dilator of 11 millimeters which means I will remove one sleeve from each implant, so each one will be 11 millimeters. Or you might say, okay, this stretched penile length was 13 centimeters, so I will select model WH13, but it's a wide penis. I could put in dilator 14 and 15 in each corpus, so I don't need to remove any sleeve. So that is how you choose the diameter and adjust the sleeves. You can remove one sleeve, or both sleeves. And sometimes you may remove only the distal part of the sleeve to narrow the implant in the tip of the penis, because sometimes the shaft is wide, but the tip is narrow, and that can also be done. So here you see selective removal of the sleeve only around the tip. We make a circumferential incision, 
three centimeters proximal to the tip. So this is a man whom we could dilate the shaft up to 13 millimeters, but the tip, only the nine millimeter dilator could go in because of distal fibrosis. So here we've removed the distal sleeve. So in the shaft, the implant will be 13 millimeters wide, but in the distal part, it will be nine millimeters wide, thus achieving the best possible fit within the corpora. And finally, we adjust the total length. So what you do is take a sizer, measure the distal length from the corporatomy, measure the proximal length from the corporatomy, add them up, and then whichever implant model you have selected, you can cut that to the required size, or you can adjust the size by adding the rare tip extender. So the proximal plus distal length will give you the total length to which you have to adjust it to. And finally, you can make additional fixations, which are actually how to manage complications. So instead, now very quickly, we will go through the surgery step. And uh, I'll just highlight the main steps of the surgery in five minutes, and then I will stop sharing. So you can use a transfer scrotal incision or a vertical penoscrotal incision to expose both the corpora cavernosa. I would recommend using a catheter so that the spongiosum is well visualized. And you can then place your thumb and finger on either side of the spongiosum to identify the urethra and the identify the corpora. Here you can see with the scissors, we are creating a plane under the tunica between two stay sutures. And then we will use the Hagar dilators to dilate these corpora. We start with size nine. If it is a fibrous corpora, then we may start with size six and dilate carefully. It's useful to hold the catheter between thumb and finger and then dilate towards the thumb or the finger. That way, the direction of the dilator will be maintained. And when you reach the corona, be very careful to gently enter the glands, but don't use too much force because this is where beginners perforate the tip of the corpus. If you don't dilate enough, the glands will be floppy as we just showed. But if you over dilate, you may perforate the corpora. So it is a careful dilatation, holding the catheter, following your finger or thumb, stretching the penis, entering the glands, but not overdoing it so that you reach the tip of the corpus in the glands, but don't over dilate the corpus. Then you will irrigate the corpora constantly to prevent infection. And also when you irrigate the corpus, if there is any blood stain fluid at the meatus, that would tell you that you've perforated the urethra. We then dilate proximally. Now we are measuring the stretched penile length, which is roughly 11 centimeters here from the symphysis to the mid glands. So we will select model WH, oh, it was 13 centimeters. So we will select model WH 13. And now we will check what diameter to use. So we are measuring the proximal length and the distal length. And that will give us the total length of the implant that we want. And we will cut the WH13 to match the total length. We will also put two dilators, one in each corpus, and then see what diameter to use. So here we are cutting the implant to match the total intracorporal length. If you make a mistake and cut too much, you can add the rare tip extender to make sure that you have the right length. Sometimes you cut a little extra and then put the rare tip. Now we have two dilators inside. The two largest dilators that fit tell us what diameter we want. So here we can see the 11 millimeter dilators have fitted well. So therefore we should remove the sleeves from the implant so that it can fit snug, but not too tight. So you can see here, we pick up the sleeve with a hemostat. And then with the scissors, we can cut the sleeve. You can cut one sleeve or both sleeves, depending on the diameter that you want to reach. So these two adjustments are very important. 
three adjustments, selecting the right implant model based on the stretched penile length, cutting the implant to the correct length based on the two intracorporal measurements, and then retaining the sleeves or removing one sleeve or removing both sleeves, depending on the size of the dilators that you can accommodate in both the corpora simultaneously. If these three things are kept in mind, then you will have a very good result with the Sha implant. Now, you often cannot decide this beforehand. So it's very important to have all four sizes available and then use one and return the remaining to the distributor. So Dr. Chandramon was mentioning some difficulty. No, it's important that the distributor should give you all four and take back the remaining three. And that needs to be discussed with the distributor. So here the sleeves are removed. You can see the tip is conical and soft. And now it's very easy. We dilate once more, wash the corpora, push it in, increase the corpora tommy to four centimeters, and then bending the implant at the hinge, pop it in. And if the corpora tommy is correct and the implant is selected nicely, the implant should go in very easily. It should reach midway into the glands. The gland should be well supported. The implant should be reasonably tight. There should be a little groove between the implants, but not too much room. And this gives you a good fit in the implants. So I think I'll stop here. There's a lot more, of course, that one can talk about. But this gives a good introductory idea, and that should give us about 10 minutes for question answers. Yes. Thank you very much. Sir, uh, uh, do you have the video of the three-piece? Uh... I can't hear you. I think you're muted. No, sir. I'm not muted. Are you audible, sir? Hello? Hello? Am I audible, sir? Hello? Yeah, now I can hear you, yes. Yeah. Sir, uh, do you have any video of three-piece uh, implant, if at all? Uh, yeah, but I didn't keep it ready because okay. three-piece... The same injection, a... same thing will be given and you make uh, uh, tunnels into the suprapubic and the crotum. Okay, additionally in the three-piece, we would make a tunnel in the scrotum to place the pump. And then we would go through the scrotal incision, retract the skin to expose the superficial inguinal ligament uh, to the superficial inguinal ring. With her finger, we would dissect the fascia, then puncture the fascia, enter the retropubic space, create a little room there, and then push the reservoir there. Okay. Uh, the inflatable would be another 20-minute talk, so I didn't think we would have time in this no session. Problem. No problem. Uh, sir, uh, when you have invented this prosthesis, when was it you invented? So the first implant was done on January 26, 1996. Who was one the patient, sign? Uh, one patient got independence from erectile dysfunction. <laughs> <laughs> who, who was the scientist associated with you, honestly? Because uh, so this is your thought. So there was no scientist. Thought? So the story behind the implant is quite interesting. 1990, when I started my practice, I, in those days, the only implant available was the AMS implant from USA. In those days, it cost only 25,000 rupees. But in 1990, 25,000 rupees was a lot of money. And the majority of my patients couldn't afford it. So I started looking for solutions. I met plastic surgeons. I met people who were importing silicon with the thought that maybe I can get a simple silicon rod and put it in. And nobody was willing to help. One day in those days, actually, this was before 1990, 1989, I started looking for solutions. So in those days, because I was doing general urology, one day I came across the Chabria shunt, which is a hydrocephalus shunt which we were using for its silicon tubing to create a sling to treat stress incontinence in the woman. When I saw the Chabria shunt, I thought if they can make this, they should be able to make an implant. So I contacted the company, which was G Surgi Well, and they're in Shah Janpur in UP and asked them that, would you like to collaborate with me? And they said, yes. And then for two years, I didn't hear from them. So I thought, well, one more lead down the drain. And then in 1992, I heard from them. And their managing director was a general surgeon trained in uh, KMC Lucknow. And he said that, sorry for the delay, we were upgrading our factory. And now let's start interacting. 
And then over the next couple of years, we interacted. The first implant was actually a simple silicon rod. And if you go to the Indian Journal of Urology, the previous issue, the cover photograph on the Indian Journal of Urology is a picture showing all the models of the Sha implant through which evolved over the three-year period. And the entire evolution of the implant is described in the Indian Journal of Urology. And that evolved over time. And the basic model was the first model. So Dr. G.D. Agarwal was the managing director of G. Sergiver. And he and I worked together through a number of models to come to the current model that is available. So this, uh, uh, this uh, stress incontinence uh, one was an Indian made material silicon when you have seen it? Correct. Okay. So the, the, you, you felt that malleability and the texture and the consistency is suitable for the uh, prosthesis, I mean to... Oh, actually, yeah. silicon comes in various grades. The silicon actually comes from Dow Corning, USA, but it was being manufactured. The device was being manufactured in India. So the Shah implant currently has silicon of different stiffnesses. It's spoken about in the article. We have soft yeah. silicon of 25 shore, stiff silicon of 75 shore, and also silicon of 50 shore. So different grades of silicon are welded together to create the implant. Nice, sir. Now, I will ask the question, sir, based on the audience as well as my questions. Number one, I feel in youngsters, uh, we should be very careful, less than 35 years, uh, proceeding to the implant, a vague question, if even after evaluation, what percentage of your penile processes is, are younger than 35 years in your entire career? What Actually, a surprisingly large number of patients are young. The reason is that many of the older patients want only medical therapy and don't want the implant. But the young patients have their whole life ahead of them and therefore are more desperate. However, the correct answer would be that less than 5% of the young patients I see need an implant. But they are a large number of them because I see them from all over the country and therefore there are a fair number. And I have a lot of young patients who have had the implant, then got married, now have children and their wife still doesn't know they have an implant. Mm -hmm. A lot of young men who got married, unconsummated marriage, nothing worked, then had the implant and succeeded. Very so nice. it's a good device, but you should not rush into it. And that's why the first part of my talk that yeah. highlighted the need of the office sildenafil, the intrapenile injection, a long rigid evaluation before you decide that they are candidates for an implant. Yes, sir. Sir, technically the corpora cavernosa is blind end at the level of the gland and penis junction. Urethra is a, a gland and part and parcel. The mucosal lining is separate. If you perforate, not the urethra, but the glands which comes just below the glabrous skin, should we terminate the procedure or we can continue? No, if the urethra is intact and you've perforated the glands, particularly with the Shah implant, there's an easy solution. The Shah implant can be cut anywhere and sutured anywhere. So we shorten the implant so that it reaches only the coronal sulcus. Yeah. And then you take a stitch through the tunica and the implant and fix it in place. On the other side, where you have not perforated, the implant can go that into the gland. That stitch will be uh, the uh, non-absorbable -absor stitch? It can be an absorbable stitch uh, like PDS or uh, monocryl because the three to six weeks that will be available with the suture are enough for the perforation to seal and for the implant capsule to form. My third question. When I started doing implants in the beginning part, I don't do often, but occasionally, like you said, I will select only sharp process. I don't dare for a costly one. And the second thing is when I'm inserting the uh, proximal or distal part, one part goes easily. Other part I struggle to insert. If the corporal incision is small, can we extend liberally so that we don't unnecessarily tear? I, I find it's difficult. A, a, a very good question and you must extend the corporotomy. It's important that the implant goes in quickly and easily and you don't struggle and touch the skin and touch here and there because that would increase the chance of in infection. Yeah. 
The corporate tummy is closed with a running suture. So whether it is three centimeters or five centimeters makes no difference. Make a liberal corporate tummy so that you can introduce it easily. But don't make a long corporate tummy in the beginning. That will affect your dilatation and sizing. After you've completed the dilatation and the sizing, before inserting the implant, then make a liberal corporate tummy. So the commonest fear doing the Dini transplant is the infection. Similarly in shock processes also. If you have signs of tenderness, if you have signs of erythema, uh, local inflammatory signs with fever, do you try a fair broad spectrum antibiotic before you incise or you look uh, more aggressively into it? So once there is evidence of infection, start the patient on intravenous antibiotics. Sometimes it may resolve. If it doesn't resolve and continues to worsen, then you need to operate. You have two options if you're operating. One is try a salvage, which means remove the implant, wash the area for 20, 30 minutes, then change drapes, change gloves, change instruments, and put in a fresh implant. That has the advantage that if it succeeds, you don't lose the corpora to fibrosis. If you're not confident doing that, or if the infection seems fulminating, then you would remove the implant, leave a drain for a few days. After the uh, infection settles down, wait three to nine months. Now, you could wait three months or you could wait nine months. During the waiting period, let the patient use a vacuum device to stretch the penis and then go ahead and re-implant, but it will be a lot more difficult. When the implant is placed slightly undersized, I feel that the erection of natural corpora cavernosa and the spongiosum reaction will also be there with blood filling the peri implant and that gives more comfort to the patient. Uh, is it true? Excellent point. I can see that you've been having very good experience. So residual tumescence over and above the implant is seen in about two thirds of our patients. And the ones who have residual tumescence are extremely happy with the outcome because yes. they have enough rigidity from the implant, but the extra tumescence makes it feel very natural. So your point is very valid that that's why we dilate under the tunica to try and preserve cavernosal tissue. And you have a snug implant, but not too tight so that there is some residual flow. And the end result in such patients is excellent. The implant protrusion, I have seen one case. In fact, I have contacted you, you have given a proper advice has protruded out of the glands and seeing through the urethra actually partly urethra and the part of the glands because it's parcel and parcel together and you told that you just remove it and leave it and there is no need to do anything and it worked out well so do you advise any uh, i mean abnormal sex like women on the top or the forcible sex must be avoided no, see what happens is if you have a late erosion, that is either because of a low grade infection or trauma to the corpora. Surprisingly, if it's a late erosion, very often you can remove one implant and the patient manages with the other implant. Yeah. What he can do depends on how comfortable he is. We don't have a problem with him doing anything. If the patient is unhappy, then after the perforation is sealed six months later, you can put in a second implant. But most patients with one implant succeed. And as you said, they may need a little modification of position and some advice not to be over ambitious and then they manage quite well. Yeah. Most of the urethral <coughs> stricture surgeries are not involving the corpora cavernosa anyway. So if a successful urethral stricture and stabilized urethral post-operative stricture is there, do we have any hesitation to put an implant or no? No, you can implant, just confirm that the urethra is stable and uh, there's no unexpected surprise you will have on the day of implantation that suddenly you try to catheterize and the catheter doesn't go in. But if it's a good stable repair, no problem, you can certainly implant. Last couple of questions. Usually we get tempted to put snugly fitting large one in the beginning unknowingly. As you become senior, probably you will definitely reduce the one one peel you remove, that is a wonderful part of the SHA processes. If you put a large one and post-operatively patient has pain, maybe in youngsters with the erection. I heard that some people will recover after one month and they usually settle well. 
you need not be in hurry to intervene uh, what is your excellent what we've done? Ex excellent question they will recover because almost invariably the corpora relaxes around the implant and what was a very tight implant initially by one to two months will actually be a good well-fitting implant and the patient will be very happy Sajjivir company is not freely available in a city like Hyderabad to get the implants. Please, can you uh, can you address this and help us? Because uh, so uh, you, I mean, it's uh, not a question to be asked to you, but a little concern uh, that we have to order one week before because they also have uh, demand supply based uh, uh, this thing. So we cannot ask them to keep the stock. I understand it is not a common surgery. Uh, Ideally, there should be enough usage in a big city like Hyderabad for them to maintain a stock. The problem with the stockists is that once they get the stock, the company doesn't take it back. That's why they're reluctant to maintain a stock. So, I mean, you have to talk to the company and the stockist and yeah. see what is the usage of the... At least now they, they, they give me it with the four to five days of... Uh, That's okay. Advance. That's okay. Sir, last question. Uh, you or busy practitioner some people say that it may take two three months of appointment time for urologists like us uh, please suggest uh, I, I know your office number is it sufficient or we can contact sometimes in uh, cases because majority of the Indians want to send they uh, still I feel even if my relative comes probably I will not operate I will send to somebody like you in that case uh, I know you are working in Lilavati Hospital. Uh, people may be afraid to go to uh, corporate in Bombay and search for the appointment. Is there any easy way for the audience? No, I think the easy way to contact me. Of interest, I am just only to... Uh, easy way to contact me, not for a patient referral, of course, but even if anyone has a query, you're most welcome to write to me. My email ID is very easy. It's just drrupinsha at gmail.com. That is d-r-r-u-p-i-n-s-h-a-h at gmail.com. So, Dr. Rupinsha at gmail.com. Any query or doubt, you're most welcome to write to me. Okay, sir. Sir, last, last uh, not question, last message you wanted to give to the youngsters. Because now it is not 1990, it is 2020. They are forced to go into either RIRS, Super NPCNL, laparoscopy, uh, Euro Oncology, and similarly, 20% of the urologists are looking for the andrology. Uh, do you have any fellowship course? Uh, unfortunately, I don't because I have six DNB residents. So most of my residents, when they pass out, would be doing independent implants, varicoceles, micro TSA, sperm retrieval. But because I have six of them, I don't have additional scope for a fellowship. However, the DNB program is currently in the process of finalizing six fellowships, and one of them will potentially be in andrology. Okay. So that in that way it may it may uh, help them. Yeah, uh, I have seen you going to the Nadiad in that way. We used to have workshops. I have attended in the beginning part of my career. Thank you very much, sir. Excellent presentation. In fact, uh, a couple of months or six months later, uh, we love to listen the TISA, uh, the, the especially varicocele uh, ligation under the microscope recorded one. Uh, we wanted to listen from you, depending on your time and this thing. Uh, maybe after uh, three, four months, six months, we like to listen that from you, sir. A lot of audience are 150 more than were on, are on the line. They are happy. And uh, like any previous your talks, your energy and crispness and time sense is absolutely great. I really appreciate, sir. Thank you very much being with you today. Thank you very much. And I appreciated being here. And your questions were very, very relevant. It's been wonderful. So we, good luck to all those who are watching. And thank